Thirty feet. Red light. Good. So, welcome everyone to the uh, Manage IQ securing security and trusting identities talk. So, today I guess we'll talk about security. Okay. Um, yep. I am Alberto with Ali and my security compadre here, Keenan Brock. And uh, we're gonna go ahead and uh, talk about stuff with security. So we'll, we'll give you a definition, talk about the mechanism that we work with the definition. Um, okay, I'm not gonna read off the slides. So I uh, give the general <laughs> idea, but the the, uh, the gist is uh, just give you one or two definitions and how those work so you can understand um, uh, how we are approaching trying to make our app more secure. So you want to do it. Cool, uh, some people call it AAA. Uh, authentication, authorization, <laughs> auditing, uh, IPA, it calls it identity, um, pers it's identity policy, policy, which is the authorization part of AAA. And auditing, what do you know, we're talking about the same in a row. Uh, authentication is what is your identity. I always think of it as, is this authentic? So I, I'm, is this really Alberto? Um, authorization is what do I trust you to do? What is your policy? And then auditing is um, what did they do or what, what you know, and trying to reinforce the, um, the law enforcement branch of, of that. Um, our goals in general for identity and trust and the goals of kind of the next slides and our next phases are we want fewer copies of the identities. That would be, um, just use a single database with usernames and passwords rather than have them stored all over the place. Or have them stored in a, a central location, uh, an external service, rather than having a copy of those across. Uh, Etsy password, having a single copy instead of having to have copy this across all of them. Also a single source of trust. So we can say, you know what, Alberto is allowed to give this presentation and I am too. Good, got it. And so there, instead of having that defined in every single system, you just have it defined in one location. So we're talking about fewer copies of both identity and trust. Uh, simpler definitions. So instead of doing something really complicated, it's simpler. Okay, cool. Got it. Um, and then hopefully leverage existing definitions. So again, that's where you have your external identity stores, uh, IPA or Active Directory or Etsy password or all these other kinds of wonderful things that other people have already defined for us and hopefully we can leverage the mechanisms that they have put around that. We can also leverage the fact that lots of people try to hack into Etsy password and so hopefully it's secure just like Bash is secure and we can at least leverage other people's work in those and we don't have to reinvent these wheels. There you go. So our desired result is, um, oh, if we have to set up passwords in fewer locations, it ends up being easier for us to configure our applications. If we only have it defined in one place, which is a database externally, um, maybe we can even get SSO. So it actually makes it easier for the user, not only the administrator, but the user. And then, as we already alluded to before, not alluded to, as I already stated before, it, it makes it more, more secure, uh, fewer vulnerability location. Right. And, and again, one thing to add, uh, delegating uh, the management of the security is, is will be done by security expertise, right? So we're, we're trusting that, we're trusting the identity to be validated properly with things like IPA, right? And AD and all, all that stuff. There's no need to reinvent uh, that level of complexity in the product. And that will help us also moving forward. With, uh, with that. Okay. Um, so, a little picture of where things are today. Right. So we, we talked about um, the identity. You know, whether whether you're, you're a person, whether you're an API coming in. In you know within the system, obviously, we also want to you know if a system is talking to another, guess what? There, there's there's system identity that needs to be validated, right? So that's kind of the entry points 
And the dark green here, we kind of alluded to, you know, where where is the information about the identity stored, right? So you're coming into SSH to the terminal. Well, guess what? Root. That's that's the pass rate. You're coming in um, uh, through the system, but we have enabled, for example, uh, LDAP or AD authentication. So we're going through. We have layers. We have modules to communicate externally. Amazon, IAM, well, there you go. There's another, another source of um, identity, uh, identity uh, source there, right? And now today we're going to demo also IPA. So that's another method, but, you know, again, the, the, the add-on is, you know, let's, let's, move, let's move all this, all this, all this stuff here. Let's move, it, let's move it out there. Let IDM take care of that. Well, guess what? It's LDAP-based. Right, they have their KDC and all that. So the the point is, there are many identity sources, and you know we want to move to a simpler, <laughs> uh, simpler picture. But at least that gives you a picture of where things are today. Is so, okay? okay. Yes. Yeah. So, so the mechanics are: you have a client who provides an identity. Go figure. The server also has a copy of your identity. So they, um, they, they either fetch that identity and they compare it, make sure you are who you say you are, and then based upon that identity, they grant trust. Um, uh, first thing is you are off, uh, authentic, so yes, I did validate that identity, and then you are authorized to see different resources. Um, and so now, something Roberto touched on. When people say identity, you think, okay, username, password, I've got a username, password. This is an individual, you know, you type in the browser, you type in identity. But everybody, every system needs an identity. So you have a rail server that's hooking up to a database. The rail server has a username and password to access the database. So really, any system or component that calls another, this can be a, a user, a person, a customer. This can be a compute, one computer system speaks to another computer system. But it can even be one component, uh, memcache, Rails, any of these other components inside of the system. It's something that calls external to, uh, to theirs. Oh, I think, uh, cool, darn. So, um, but it's really important to note that, right, it's not just people. The mechanics of providing identity, we've got passwords that we know, we have Kerberos tickets, uh, IP addresses. Uh, when you're hooking up to Postgres, sometimes you can protect to say you have to type a username and password. Other times you can say what host are you connecting to. And also we put on firewalls as well. Uh, our memcache server internally, we access the memcache, we locked it down from the firewall, nobody else can access it. So that's actually protected by host-based identity. So you know what, I believe you're from this host, we're gonna let everybody through. If we didn't do that, we would actually have to pick another one from the list so that we could access it. And something that everybody says, yeah, you know, um, identity has to be there. It's either assumed, you know, I, I just open up my web server in the world, everybody in the world can access that. You don't have any extra special privileges. But if you did want to do that, if you did want to grant more access, um, you would need to have some form of identity for the user. We'll do the next one. Oh, the server's got a copy of it, so either they, uh, they don't have to have the plain text, and we've done a good job in our system not having the plain text, but you can have the MD5, the SHA-1 of the password, and compare it. Or, in some cases, or, or uh, IDRSA, so you have the public key. Nice thing about those systems are just because I get, I get access to the server's copy of a user's identity, hopefully we can store in such a way that they can't then use that somewhere else. Now we do have in our system that we need to access, per, uh, on behalf of the user, we need to access a cloud service. So it, uh, it does make security a little tricky in our case, is that we need to uh, store a recoverable identity that we can use on our customer's behalf to access the web. In the perfect world, we wouldn't need to. In the perfect world, it would be all one-way hashes. We wouldn't be able to access the identity. But just to keep that in mind in our system, we do need to use this password so we can log into OpenStack, so we can log somewhere else. That is one of the identities from the first page, something that's like the real identity. So just something to keep in mind.
but our goal is on the server is to protect it. So the compromise, so people don't steal all your credit cards and all that good, good stuff. And um, yeah, you want to do it? Okay. Alrighty. So um, extending on the different types of uh, sources, right? So here we're talking about okay. So we have identity information. It could be user password information that comes from the Postgres data, right? Um, and, you know, accessing Postgres, right? So you have uh, um, PG, the shadow, sorry, the PG shadow here. Host base, whether it's, it's a, you know, uh, IP address or what have you, we have information about, okay, we're securing it, you're allowed to go in, you're not allowed to go in IP based. Um, so that, that would be that. Um, file system, that would be a standard, things like um, password, SSH to the console, so that would be there. Um, LDAP, so when that identity information is gathered, like, of course that's external, um, you know, whether it's going in through the Active Directory you know, definition or we've enabled external authentication, that's still LDAP, but it's going through, uh, through the IBM path. Um, one of the benefits of also enabling um, IBM, you know, the IPA product, is you get Kerberos out of, the, out of the box. So that gets enabled for you. You got your KNets, your, you know, you have your identity, right, um, you know, as part of your ticket. But that's again coming in from the uh, IPA uh, installation. You have your whole KPC, you know, essentially, um, you know, like a, a Microsoft. Realm, uh, you know, for for Win, for Unix, so, <laughs> which is a pretty nice uh, feature to have here. Uh, Amazon, that's another source that goes through um, the Amazon client, and of course the certificate authority. You can talk about that. that, that yeah, part. yeah. Postgres, uh, kind of neat. We don't think about, or at least it took a while. Uh, you have uh, in your database.yaml and. Rails, you can access a database. So that uh, server, the MD5 of your database login is actually stored in PG Shadow. But when users log into a database, so that's the end user, we have those passwords stored in like the user's table. And then when we try and access external systems, we have those identities, which now are even stored in a different form. Those are stored in, oh shoot, the authentication stable. Sorry, you're right there in the slide. But it's kind of interesting, it's like, and also file system, Etsy password is one location where we store them. But we also have a, encryption keys. Um, uh, so on the file system, the database.yaml file, that's the place that Rails stores the way to access. So it ends up being a lot of different places on the file system where we do store some of these uh, um, Identities. Good news about uh, as we're trying really hard is Etsy password that's stored in MD. Well, I don't know if it's using MD5 right, but a one-way hash to store it. So a lot of these are, are stored in the location that or in a form that you can't get the original out easily. Uh, there, certificate authority. Yeah, it's kind of fun. Like Kerberos, for certificate authority, you generate your own private key, and nobody ever sees this private key. But we use a central stamp of approval called a certificate authority to say, yeah, this key is legitimate. Uh, the difference between a, a public private key and a certificate is just you have a stamp of approval to associate a uh, user, Alberto, with Alberto's key that he happens to have locally. But uh, uh, most of these actually have the server knows or knew your key, your private key at one point or another. Uh, certificates, the server actually never knew it. So the reason why people talk about that a lot is there's a, a slightly less version of trust there. You trust, um, in the SSL world, you trust them a little less because they never ever even saw your, your protected key. So that's the reason why the web is a little better is maybe I trust my bank, but I'm not sure how much I trust them. So in that case, the certificates, that's why that's all the rage is in the internet scale, you can even tone down the trust you have with somebody else. Ah, there you go. So, you want to go in depth? Are you good? Uh, sure. Yeah, good. So, again, we, we kind of covered this picture before uh, describing the different identity sources. Um, 
but uh, we'll talk a little bit more of, okay, so, so what's, what's going on here, right? Um, so before we started this, this uh, endeavor here, uh, enabling AD and LDAP, uh, the user comes in and uh, we authenticate via an LDAP driver, an AWS client, um, to, uh, you know, to, to access that, to, the, to verify that yes indeed, you are who you are and uh, you're good to go and we trust you're gonna do something nice. So that's beautiful. Uh, same thing, you know, we access uh, our users internally from the Postgres database. That's fine and dandy, that's the that's way uh, it would work. Now, the one thing I'll, you know, we're gonna show is uh, the enablement of, of IPA, right? So coming in through um, um, the, the external authentication, what essentially we're doing is on the appliance itself is uh, going through an IPA client installation phase. Again, that's all them under the cover for you. But essentially, it configures Apache um, to do authentication for you. And this, you, the, the Linux system, uh, the system security services daemon, as well as PAM, is configured to communicate with the IPA server. So uh, essentially, we have moved uh, the, the validation uh, of, of the identity trust away from here. We're delegating that to Apache and IPA. So, yes, at the end of the day, you know, we're still getting our 401s and what have you. Uh, but the logic and and, and the core um, framework is move, is moving out of us, right? And the beauty the beauty is IPA is the full realm, right? Is the full realm is um, implements the full KPC and Kerberos and is extendable. So you know, we'll talk about that for future paths. So, um, so that's kind of uh, coming in. Uh, anything else you want to add? Yeah, it's kind of fun is that the user has an identity to access Apache. Apache decides whether they like the username and password or not. And then when Apache speaks to Rails, um, that one is actually left wide open. It's only tied up to you have to be from the same host. That's how that's secured. When the worker talking to the database, they have an identity stored in database.yaml file to allow them to access Postgres. And in this case, uh, for us to decide um, that Rails is there, Apache uh, speaks to SSSD. Now, um, that is from the same host. That's why they're allowed to talk. But this, to talk to the external host, we need to have some trust there. So in the appliance console, we actually need to do configuration so that we store <coughs> a Kerberos key tab file on the server so that they are then allowed to access the external systems. So when you're taking security mines, every line here has, give or take, a username and password associated with it. Which starts to then say, oh, you know, I guess that's, it, it took me a while to understand that. And, it's, and the reason why you need that is Rails is talking to the database, and Rails says, why don't you just delete this record? Or do we want anybody in the world to delete this record? I mean, we're granting them some trust here, aren't we? So we have to verify their identity so that identity can do that trust. I've already said those words enough times in the presentation, so you guys get the gist. And that's what authorization, authentication is. And I've already said 20 times already, or maybe more. Please don't think the user is the only person who has identity here. Every single line has identity, every line has authentication, and when you're looking at an application and thinking about putting these together, we do have to be cognizant that we want to have an idea of how this is there, and if you're on a system and say, well, can anybody just access this? You know, we're, we're calling up Amazon and saying, hey, let's start charging some credit cards. Let's start kicking off some VMs. We don't want anybody just to do that. So we have to have somewhere a username and password stored so that Amazon will trust them and allow them to kick this off. Okay, I think I'm dead horse, right? No, so yeah, and again, part, part of, you know, yeah, what, once we <coughs> leave, you know, the, the identity is verified, the, the, it's onto the second A, which, which is authorization, right? So, you know, the mechanics as it is today and it still makes sense in the future, so when a user logs in, 
right? Uh, there's a check mark in the UI saying, hey, make sure that user object is replicated there. Uh, but it's not for the password. It's, it's more for uh, the mapping of that user to this role, right? So once we have that, then, then we can manage the what can you do on the system by role assignment and all that. So. Cool. Alberto's mentioned Kerberos, and you get the realm. It was just like, it's, you know, you're all excited about saying, and you get the realm. Why do we care? Uh, a, centralized for user data, that's great, configuration. But also, all of these connections can be secured by the same mechanism. So once you start to get into the realm, now obviously this wouldn't be logged in as, hey, Brock, this would be logged in as uh, Rails application. It's either logged in as, if you will. And hopefully associated with a POSIX user that is known to IPA. And so now, all of a sudden, hopefully, it'd be nice if we didn't have to have a database.yaml file here to be able to access the database. It'd be nice if we could say, just use Kerberos. And then based upon the logins, we can use uh, leverage SE Linux a little more, leverage some of these other security mechanisms that were written by other people, not us. Then we can have a lot of these connections hooked up that, that leverage that. Obviously, once we start going into this world with Amazon, uh, we. Uh, they're not tied into our Kerberos. These two, though, as you mentioned, do go away as we're trying to get rid of a lot of our uh, password. We'll just let Apache do all that work for us, and we get to delete code, which makes, always makes Joe happy. Yeah, so we grant trust. Either you have the right, the same password, um, you come for the correct, or you have a ticket. Uh, that, that's a, uh, for Kerberos, was this ticket valid? Also, a neat thing about Kerberos, uh, I can grant Alberto trust because he's a computer. That's, oh, you're on a computer. That, that's a good computer. But what happens when that computer gets <clears throat> bad stuff on it? Um, what happens when that computer is compromised? Uh, Kerberos has passwords that actually expire after a certain amount of time. So that's one way of doing it. SSL has another way which they revoke. They go ahead and revoke a password, uh, a certificate to say the certificate is no longer valid. So at least now when we're getting away from the username and password realm, but we're getting more into this uh, security, public, private key realm, that buys us the ability to revoke this trust that we had in a particular identity or mark an identity invalid. Uh, which is something that's important. Yeah, and the beauty is you can you know, decide, hey, it's not just the user, there's something wrong, I want to really secure this database. Let me, let me close all the guys coming into this database, services, rails, and all that. And you can control that with uh, you know, the IPA you want. So. Okay. So we're going to actually do a live demo. Yeah, I'm fire here, huh? <laughs> um, <laughs> So what we've done so far, right, um, we've introduced external authentication in, as part of Manager IQ. What is external authentication? So the external authentication, <laughs> so yeah, we had before LDAP and AD, but external authentication here is really, hey, I want to enable um, authentication via Apache. Right? The Apache, uh, authentic Apache based authentication and behind the scenes, yeah, we're wiring up all that's needed to go to IPA, right? So, so it's uh, that part of the aspect. So with that, uh, the value add here is, you know, we have you know, the corporation, enterprise, what have you, uh, has one central repository of trust, right? Of trust identity, IPA, IDM, right? So the work that we've done is you know, enabling that uh, with that, with the web UI, you can log in using your IPA credentials. You can access the REST API using the same credentials from IPA. And we've also enabled the SSL login. Uh, that's Kerberos ticket based. So, um, on that note, let's jump into um, the demo. For clarification, for clarification, the ex uh, we pulled this uh, central location. This is a central location for user identity, not for a lot of the other components. We haven't um, enabled 
that for Postgres yet, or some of those others. But that's a more focused on user identity, user logins. All right, we hear some domains. Okay, cool. Okay. So uh, this is the appliance console, uh, 929 build. So the first thing, uh, again, some of the prerequisites for enabling uh, IDM uh, IPA, a uh, very strong DNS requirement between uh, the system, between the IPA server, um, as, uh, as well as time syncing. So got to make sure that's a very strong requirement for, for Kerberos. Otherwise, <laughs> ticketing system uh, won't work quite well. It's very frustrating. Yeah. It's, it worked yesterday. It didn't change anything. Like That can honestly be the case. But because you're running VMs and you're shutting them down and bringing them up, they get timed off, yeah. timed out all the time. So we're going to go ahead and configure external authentication. So here is the configuration stage. We want to tell the uh, web server, the rail, the appliance, we want to give it what it needs so it can speak to the IPA server. And it, then the IPA server knows they can trust them going forward in the future, whether that's with Kerberos tickets, whether, yeah. Yep. And you know, part of the field that are being asked here is, Who's the IPA server? And again, we we rely, you know, we extract the domain out of that. So the realm, it could be based directly off of that, but it could be also in a different sub realm. So you can also update that information. And the next is the uh, uh, the IPA uh, principal. So we need to be able to go in there. So with the administrative uh, credentials. Principal means login. Yeah. But okay. All right. So this is just uh, Do you verifying. Yep. The information, I'll take about a minute. Sorry. And the good news is that we were able to default most of the fields for the user. We couldn't default the password um, but uh, and the name of the server. But at least it can go through. And uh, it, it, uh, you want to say which what is modifying in general? Uh, yeah, so what's, what is modifying here? Yeah. Right. So uh, part of uh, this configuration, it, you know, in this particular step, right? So we're installing the IPA client. So uh, part of that installation, again, is, you know, we don't own the tool, right? The IPA team, security team own that. So we're basically delegating, okay, configure me to be safe. So part of that is uh, setting up Kerberos, setting up SSSD uh, with the IPA server, and establishing that trust, right? So there, there's a HTTP key tab, um, that's needed for Kerberos communication. Uh, we create an HTTP service just so that uh, Apache is, is uh, you know, allowed to, to go that route. So all this stuff is done behind the scene. We, we enhance, we update the uh, Apache config files uh, you know, for, for a Rails app so that the configuration is done behind the scene. Uh, whether you're you know, logging in via the, uh, the console, uh, or REST API entry points, so all that nitty gritty detail. Is, so when, if we didn't do this, the actual setup was three pages of manual <laughs> configuration, so we try to ease the pain and, and, and hide that. And obviously we have some uh, SELMX enhanced uh, enablement to be done there. Um, once everything's done, we restart the uh, SFS daemon and HTTPD um, for you. So. That's all done. So when you come back to the summary screen, you'll notice the external auth is enabled, and that's the IPA server um, uh, path. Okay. Well, one thing I think is neat about here is that uh, SSSD and PAM, uh, PAM pluggable authentication module, is very Linux. I mean, it's, it's kind of the core there. So you can actually SSH into this box and use the central identity as well. And um, part of the, the IPA team is trying to push is that instead of us speaking with these centralized uh, authentication servers, we're just talking to Linux services to say, hey, please do passwords for us. So we actually removed it from the application layer, almost moved it into the operating system layer. It, it is in, it's not in the kernel, it's in user space. But it, so now we're just, just leveraging like give or take the operating system doing this. If a user has slightly different requirements or different plugins that they need to use from the operating system layer for PAM, 
in theory, yeah. they could just swap in and use anything they want on top of this. So this really gives us uh, not only a more secure route, but it gives us extensibility as well. Okay. So again, by default, the Manage IQ appliance is a database only. So the first thing we need to do is go in and enable external authentication. Now what happened behind the scenes is we spoke, we typed in our identity to Apache. Apache didn't care. Apache passed that off to Rails. Rails said, okay, I have this username and password, I need to validate it. Now it actually typed its own username and password to connect to the database so it could get to the database, database you know, file. And then we looked in the users table and said, hey, does this MD5 with salt actually match it? And so the admin's username and password was compared, and that came through. So that was one route where it was in the upper right-hand corner where the username and password are actually stored in the database. But, and for admin, that is always the case. Uh, we didn't want something to happen. Uh, it's like your root password on a system, you, you always want it to work, whether the centralized mechanism is down. Uh, we had the same case for admin in our system. So what are you doing? So here we're enabling external uh, authentication. Um, so as you know, if you compare that with eight, you know, LDAP or Amazon, where you know we ask all the nitty gritty details, again, it's done via um, on the Apache side. But they're about the same fields. <coughs> yep. We just happen to have done it as initial configuration rather than via the web. So the one important uh, option is getting users uh, groups from external authentication. That's important when. Um, one of the requirements is that users uh, are assigned to um, a group, a POSIX group on IPA, uh, but we can grab that information uh, through the DBUS, all the gritty details, get that information from IPA, and uh, the requirement here is that that group has to be created internally, uh, and that's where you go ahead and assign the role. So. The, the authorization part is, is, is at play here. Yes, I, I didn't think of this before, but the, the first half or the other part was establishing, hey, we want to use this for identity. Down below is where we want to use authorization, where we want to use trust. So here is saying, let's get the roles. Again, the purpose of you joining a role gives you extra privileges to the system. That's where you get the authorization, that's where you get the trust. So, and the other uh, check mark here, I won't turn it on yet, but uh, you can enable SSO behavior separately than uh, just external authentication. We'll leave that off for now. And that is done. So, what I'm going to do now is log in into the UI <coughs> using an IPA account. CFME administrator um, actually came in from so let's go into the IPA console All right. so here again centrally located centrally managed um, you got your users um, and user groups and again it's, it's one place that you have to worry about and you just leverage that infrastructure from, from behind the scene. So um, uh, uh, yes, uh, and the neat thing here is uh, some people have, uh, some of our customers have access to to what groups are actually associated with the user in the LDAP hierarchy and some people do not. So uh, but we do have the ability as I think most of the room knows but just uh, calling it out. We do have the ability to, we can, uh, in this case, you added a custom uh, role here, which is linked across. But if they had uh, X, Y, five admins, which means something to them, not to us yet, we do have the ability in our system to be able to link those two groups and grant accordingly. So that was uh, one noticeable requirement is we can't assume that we can modify the central source of identity um, for our needs. We had to work around that. Next. I didn't do that work. <laughs> you didn't see it? <laughs> no, I mean, that's all great. So we're going to 
hit now the uh, REST API into that system. So whether you're coming in through, really small, whether you're coming in with, you know, through the web UI, um, just, uh, the nail bar may be able to change. Pretty, uh, pretty low res here. That won't be the authentication. So we want basic. As we go, so let's go in there, Keenan. I didn't see. <coughs> I didn't see me over there. I just saw you. The result is here, <laughs> but yeah, essentially we, we have gone in, but using uh, the screen is hard. Okay, but we have, we have gone in through uh, you know, whether or not the, if I didn't if we didn't enable that, then I would have gone in the 401 here. So so there are a couple of different endpoints we do have into our app. Uh, one of which is the basic login, but we also have yeah our our REST endpoints. We have a couple of different ways to access our application, and we needed to add this, um, add the IPA in, in two or three different places. Yeah. So this is showing that. Um, also, neat, this is not an application we wrote. If it was, I don't think we call it SOAP UI. So, um, and so it's neat that general purpose tools can still come in through such a to demo. Okay, so the next part of the demo is we're gonna go in via Kerberos tickets. So the one thing, uh, we're going to do here is enable SSO. Right? So, you know, without SSO, when you know you refresh the page, it's a normal login screen. Right? We enter your name and password. Um, here, I'm going to log out. Uh, again, this is running on this client here. I just want to make sure I do not have any Kerberos tickets. K stands for Kerberos. We are going to refresh the page. So, when you, you refresh the page and you have SSO enabled, you will get better and valid SSO credentials. Um, so that doesn't stop you from logging in with a regular uh, demo that we are, a regular uh, IP you know, username and password here, or, or the admin. But let's have fun here and. Get myself a ticket. All right. And all we're going to do is you can click here for the field are empty or reload the page. And you're actually seeing SSO in action. We have gone in, um, gotten the information about the user, um, and that's, you know, we're actually in uh, the app. I think they could have been any page. You just happen to be. Go for it. Is there any yeah. other way to get a ticket besides going to command and getting a ticket? Um, yeah, some of, some of the uh, like, like if, you, if you look at the yeah like the rel uh, UI, there's a way or CentOS, there's a way to 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 get your authentication there. So you can enable your ticket via the uh, the desktop. Okay. Or, and sometimes or when you log into rel, when you, when you log into rel, there are ways that it would. So well, you're logging into your stuff and you're happy. And just well, you're logging into RHEL using actually the same exact username and password, right? right. And then after that, it will um, in your X session, it can uh, just, just make because you so logged in the first place. You right. are at that time you establish your identity. Yeah, you that, can that's start. Very single sign on. Sign on once and then you're done. Yeah, and yeah. you're you're signing onto your workstation, yeah. and then that propagates the logs up. You finally, you and I think that's log, I think that's the original use case. Yeah. yeah. So I've logged out, I've changed my ticket to be now Keenan, and I'm logging in. Instead of a refresh, I'm just hitting the login screen here, and I'm logged in as Keenan. Now Keenan happens to be a member of two, uh, two groups, and then you know, from, from an agile queue, you have the choice of, of choosing you know, which role to, to act on. Uh, so one thing I do want to mention is, again, from a use case perspective, even though we are uh, SSO enabled, uh, the use case was, okay, but I really need to get in as an admin. So you can log out. As you notice, it didn't attempt the SSO. 
but you know you need more privileges or you want to get in as for example uh, admin you know you're allowed to do that so, so alberto is on his computer he's having problems his his account's not set up correctly i come in as an admin i need to fix it i can either walk back to my desk do something walk back here or in this case i can actually go in and tweak it and the reason why we show off something like this is it's hard to say, oh yeah, always trust its identity. Oh no, no, I changed my mind. They're trying to assume a different identity than the global identity that's defined for them from Kerberos. Yeah, so that's why we're excited by this mundane use case. And you know, again, being ticket, uh, ticket based, you know, even on the IPA UI, uh, what is it? Yeah, it's too small. Yeah, there it is. Uh, so if I log out from from IPA, and I say, uh, they give you a choice to re-log in, guess what, they automatically do SSO. And since I was in Brock, that's who I'm in. I'm in as logged in as Keenan. So again, standard mechanism honored by the, you know, various tools, and that's, that's where we are. So again, so so yeah, the, the takeaway is um, it's it's, Trying to minimize the number of uh, uh, locations. So here, where we have a single source of, of uh, IDM, and uh, let's go back to the slides, and we honor that on the different endpoints <coughs> to the system. Okay, so we've done that. Okay. Oh, yeah, I think it was a good one. So the goals are reduce the number of places that you have passwords, reduce the number of places, or I think we use the word identity there, also reduce the number of places that you have trust. This is just one example of us potentially removing it from our user's table and putting it down to some place that was already defined by the company for usernames and passwords. For individual. Go ahead. Okay, so again, tighter by authorization of components, Less places where the stuff is, is it's, it's you know, better management from our perspective. Uh, the specific words here, title of authorization, is you know, going forward, um, uh, you, know, you have access to the database, you can do anything, right? But you can also uh, introduce uh, different identities, uh, have better final granularity on what a particular account can do to a database. Again, central place you can you know add these, extend it easily. So you know that's the vision going forward. Uh, in the previous charts, we had LDAP and AD um, accessed via special modules. Um, they are uh, you know from the same way that we've configured IPA via IPA client. That's all goes to the SSSD configuration. The idea is in the future to also do regular uh, AD and LDAP. Well, AD I'll mention separately, but um, to move that also outside uh, outside our internal application and have that um, configuration done outside you know, via SSSD. So moving that out, so the authentication will be done um, by the Apache layer, right? Uh, but again, it's, it's one configuration, one place that, that um, um, identity information is stored. Uh, so we don't have to replicate all over. Um, so that's that. Uh, again, moving forward, um, so AD was one thing we mentioned. Uh, there are current implementations of, of SAML, uh, two-factor authentication. Okay, all of these I've seen, uh, these are Apache modules you can load up and configure. Um, so we have ways to uh, <laughs> extend extend the mechanisms and, and go forward. But, at least it's you know we we're at a good place to you know, start looking at these. And, um, yeah, well, uh, and the tighter authorization, um, we have probably now fewer accounts that maybe have a little more power. So the question is, can we reduce, or actually maybe even increase the number of accounts that we have, but just that they have uh, less privilege, so that if uh, something's not configured exactly the way that the customer decides or the end, uh, not end user, the administrators decide, uh, then at least there's just less exposure. So it's kind of protecting them by getting these, the, the, the trust, the privileges down. Uh, I don't think we have a question slide. Any questions? Yeah, there's no slide, I guess. 
Yeah. <laughs> it's too secure. You can't see it. You have to be authenticated. Very secure. I think I got it. What's your question? No, I um, I'll ask a question. Maybe you can further. I'm not sure. But SAML. Yes. How does that play into what you just discussed? Does it have any bearing to the conversation? Sure. You can certainly. Again, SAML would be if you think about it. It's it's. It's an identity source, right? It has its own definition of users and roles and what have you. Uh, but again, yeah, the, it's relevant in a way that the hook into it, like SAML SSO, would also be done via Apache, right? So they have these SAML modules that you can configure the same way that we've done with Kerberos SSO to ID. So yeah, uh, but that's that's all doable. Yeah. It, it, and, um, I guess there are two answers. One is with our help or without our help. So let's do the one without our help on the SAML conversation. Uh, since we trust Apa the um, Apache with these changes goes externally, determines the trust from IPA, and then passes it to Rails. Now Rails has a certain bit of trust and says, okay, you said they're logged in as Alberto. I, I believe you. But we don't really know how they went about gaining that. So that means that you, as an administrator, can actually modify Apache to use whatever mechanism you want. Or you can tie into, uh, it probably for that one particular case, it would be on the Apache side. But maybe another case, you would actually modify the core operating system trust mechanisms, uh, uh, PAM, SSSD. So you can modify those. And then theoretically, obviously in practice, it's, it will work without any modifications to our code. You're just modifying the Apache configuration. And Google would tell you exactly how to modify Apache configurations. Google won't necessarily tell you how to modify our code, right? So, so we definitely move that into a place that allows you to leverage whatever Google and um, stack overflow answers you want to have. So in the, in the idea of, say, like Active Directory, kind of Active Directory is currently supported natively to Power Force. But there's no reason why you couldn't have Active Directory trusted by IBM to define everything inside of AD. And then Cloudforms is effectively logging on as AD users, but it's doing it via ADM. Would you do SAML in the same way? Or no, you'd always do SAML via Apache, you wouldn't do it through IBM? Um, the SAML mechanism it, um, is more, um, I think of like an OAuth kind of you kind of bounce people around to do work. And so that's kind of the, the knowledge of how to bounce somebody to a login page and bounce back, or 302s, whatever you want to call it. That is a HTTP mechanism. So I would imagine it'd be more on the Apache side to configure it. Maybe SAML is set up that you could end up getting those identities through IPA, but the mechanism of the redirection, so I'm not sure where the mecha, uh, the mechanism of the redirection, everything like that, would have to be via an Apache module. The location of the identity, that might be through IPA or SSSD or PAM, they, any one of those. So the second part of my question was, um, Active Directory, whilst it's supported natively to platforms today, is, do we continue to implement that way, or would we be uh, more prudent to say, right, we're always going to have IBM as the authentication source. Whether IBM is actually a trusted forest of an active directory implementation somewhere else is by the by. Yeah, what, what, what's the advice there? Do we do we do we go native or do we always go via IBM for AD? Um, I guess the, the pr prudence there is, you know, not every customer is going to want IBM, right? So. Whether you do the hooks to AD via IDM, uh, basic IDM directly, or just from an Apache SSSD configuration, because essentially it is a, a an LDAP directory, right? So, you know, again, uh, whether you rely on IDM for it, again, it's, it's not our place to, to make that decision, right? Uh, you know, when to move to you know, you know, offering internal versus external, again, it's how easy is that doable or configurable? But again, we made it very painless for IP directly. Our parents' console, easy. You know, 
configuring additional sources rather than to look at that. But, but the goal is not to have AD access from our Ruby code. That is the, the stated goal. Right, so we, right. Should, we should stay away from but the when statement and the implicate, uh, but uh, but we're also definitely stating we're not suggesting everybody uses IDM because um, that is a business decision that's not ours to make. So we're hoping that if somebody wants to use IDM, they can do Active Directory through that. Yeah. If they want to do Active Directory, um, and this is not in the immediate term, this is longer term goals, we would like that to go through Apache as well or the SSSD route, uh, that's where Active Directory will tie in, not via Ruby. Yeah, I can say there's two sides to this. There's a managed IT direction, and then there's a Red Hat direction. Right. And the direction that IDM uses is obviously clear. Um, but we would, want, we would want people to use, well, authenticated by IDM. We would want cloud forms. Oh, yeah. Because either. Yeah. yeah. So one last thing before I um, you know, stop capitalizing. In AD, you can drag the groups back. So uh, you can go into PowerPoints and you can say, right, I'm authenticating as this user. Um, can you uh, impersonate this? So bind as this, uh, impersonate as this, bring back the list of groups that person belongs to, and then see if you will go and create those groups or group inside of this database to match it to the blog. That doesn't seem to appear there for IDM. You have to manually create the group. So, um, some sort of auto generation stuff. Great. So if we have stored in, I can speak IDM more than AD, but if we stored in IDM groups that a user is a member of, yeah. and those happen to be groups that already exist in our system, yeah. then they're mapped, no problem. If they're mapped to groups that we don't know about, then we will need to go in and map the users. At this time, we do not have search in our system to be able to say, please tell me all of the users that are in a particular group, or some of those other kinds of more advanced mechanisms of looking up users. We, um, the API has been written for us to access it. So we had to wait, you know, for time and why. So at least it's right for us to have more advanced search capabilities on our side. Uh, but that's, it's either if the group, if we already have a definition for that group, so we have access to IDM or AD even for that matter, and we can specify our normal groups for cloud forms uh, or anti-IQ, right? That um, that just works. I just wonder if it would be to say have a situation where because IDM is authenticated and, and we're happy that the authentication is successful, so that they're not trusted, right? But that you could say into Manage IQ there's a default behavior here. The default is to auto create the group that the user belongs to. I don't know how you worked out which group, but you auto create a group and then you bind it to a default role, which would be the standard restricted users or something. So at least users could log in and get an experience rather than having no experience and waiting for an administrator to create a group and a relationship. For our demo, we gave a group to a user over in the, a in the um, LDAP side. Yeah. We gave them a user, which is the <coughs> default group. Right. And then we had a role for that one. I would imagine that most users in a system have at least one group already predefined. At configuration time, we could just add that. Yeah. But we don't have the, if they have no groups, then we'll automatically insert another group. Yeah. And we don't really have the ability to modify the groups that they're members of. Whatever groups they're members of in LDAP, those are the groups we're members of here. And then we assign roles according to those groups. Yeah, I so see you do it the other way back. So you do it from the IDM side rather than the cloud form side. Right, but if we did in the cloud form side, um, the cloud form still has to have some kind of group that they're a member of. Yeah. It will be a, it, maybe it's not a um, cloud form de defined group, it's more of a company XYZ group, and then we can associate, well, you know that, you know how to do that better than I do, right? You can associate to that. Yeah. Um, so, but that could be company grade X, but we are assuming that they are members of at least one group, and we are also assuming that all of this group management is done on that side. Uh, well, it would be check, check box. Sounds like a feature request, actually. You come in, you're authenticated, you hand us a bunch of groups from Meldap or whatever, and none of them are found. 
We still let the guy in and the default group. Yeah, I'm, I'm not like like I buy into my own use case anymore, I think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think the way you described is a lot better, actually. So all you have to do as an as a administrator of the actual um, of, of manager, of the app, you, if you create one group, one default group inside of IDM that matches the role, then the responsibility now is on IDM. Every time you add a user, as long as you put them into that group, then they'll get the default experience. Right. It's not really cloud forms to manage like user responsibility to let people come in and have a default experience. It's more the LDAP side is responsible. Wait, there is the, um, the, there's a checkbox at the bottom to say include groups, which should be quite honest. Um, I've always checked, and that says please get the, the roles from um, LDAP. In theory, if you wanted to manage all of that on this side, a user would come in, they wouldn't be a member of a group, and then you could use our application to map all of those groups. I don't, that's I guess technically one system is in charge of the identities, in charge of the authentication. Uh, we would be in charge of the authorization, the trust, the pr uh, privilege roles. Um, pr uh, not privilege roles, uh, authorization. authorization. And in that case, I don't see as much. It's like we're all talking about making a centralized form. And I, I, I would imagine you would want to have authorization and authentication. That might be good for a proof of concept or something where you only have three users just to find them. You don't want to go through several balls. Yeah, I mean, but it just makes it, but you don't know when you're adding it on this side, you don't know who that user right, is. Right, it's only checking the password. That's it. So, so it would check passwords, but then we don't have any trust associated with them yet. So they would need to log in, it would fail, and then we could add the groups, and then they could log in later. Right. So even for a proof of concept, I, I don't see any, like, you can see customers more than I do. I don't. I don't see any use case for it. But that's why we've left it as is. I think it's similar. If the DOCs become that much of an issue, then we will just have like held it. There's some crimes, IDM, in a DOC with a bunch of predefined groups that definitely exist in front of the managed IT platforms. That would be awesome. Yeah. Everybody else wants to go. Any other other questions? How to protect your credit cards? <laughs> Can you tell all the other people that answer? <laughs> don't write it down anywhere, don't use it, you'll be all set. Be debt free too. Okay, cool. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.